Um, I'm Sarah Hampson. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs. Um, I'm speaking um, about uh, my research um, that's cl a collaboration with uh, my colleague Jamie Huff, who's at Bridgewater State University in Massachusetts. Um, I want to echo my colleagues very much um, for thanking um, the Office of Research, um, particularly the, the staff, um, Kara and Lisa, who worked really hard with me on um, submitting um, my RRF uh, proposal a couple of times. Um, but uh, I, I definitely think that um, the resubmission process was really worth it. Um, and, uh, and, and thank you very much for that. And thanks to the RRF for supporting this research. Um, I feel very humbled <laughs> to, to be part of the, um, the group of folks that are doing that. So, okay, here we go. Um, that work? Oh, okay. Um, so legal mobilization um, is the theoretical framework for this project. And legal mobilization scholarship basically asks, um, how do activists and others use law to try to achieve social change? Um, and that's kind of the framework for our big question in this research, which is, um, how do activist demands and institutional responses converge and diverge around Title IX's provisions um, regarding campus sexual harassment and assault. So that's a very big mouthful that I'm gonna unpack um, in the whole next uh, seven minutes. But um, essentially we're interested in um, this idea of social change and activists versus institutional um, responses. Um, so uh, project data, um, we're doing in-depth interviews um, with those who work closely with Title IX, um, activists, policy advocates, attorneys, um, student activists particularly, um, as well as Title IX coordinators and university administrators. And then we're also collecting a data set of university policies um, and administrative data. So one of the first things that I tell my students in law and society um, is that a law isn't an objective fact. It's um, something that requires interpretation for it to mean something, right? Um, and not only judges are involved in this meaning making, but all of us are involved in meaning making. You and I are part of making meaning of the law. So we're interested in the meaning making process around this law called Title IX that you may have heard of. Title IX is um, a section of the Educational Amendments Act of 1972, and it essentially just says, um, no person shall be just subjected to discrimination in education, right? But what does that mean? Um, so there's a bunch of people involved in figuring out what that means. The first obvious people are judges and lawmakers. <laughs> and I, yeah, I love this picture, um, just to make you happy. Um, and judges, uh, judges over time have said um, that uh, basically um, American, uh, the, that the failure of institutions, colleges and universities to protect students from or confront sexual assault and harassment actually is a form of discrimination. Um, legislators too are involved in, in this interpretation process. They've um, passed a bunch of laws that are um, requiring institutions to interpret Title IX in a particular way and to comply with Title IX in particular ways. But we don't care so much about that. Um, we care a little bit more about um, the institutions themselves. How are institutions and folks who are in institutions, Title IX coordinators, administrators, involved in interpreting what Title IX means in order to create policies um, and, uh, and actually comply with Title IX on their campuses? So colleges and universities actually vary widely in how they comply with Title IX um, and in how they interpret what Title IX means on their college campuses. Um, so for example, they vary along different axes like you know, how many staff they have and what kinds of staff they have, um, in investigation and complaint resolution methods, support services for students who are making complaints. Um, there's wide variation around um, the country. So part of it is tracking that. So for example, um, looking at two institutions of relatively similar undergraduate um, uh, makeup. Um, you look at the type of staff and support services that they have are really different, but really key is that their decision making around complaints is really different too. So in Oregon, University of Oregon, for example, um, they have these employees um, who are considered impartial investigators who are making decisions based on complaints. Whereas at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, um, the folks who are making decisions uh, about the complaints and dealing with the resolution process are actually conduct, uh, student conduct hearing boards that are made up of faculty, staff, and students, so really different kinds of responses at similarly situated institutions. 
So one of the things that we're doing is um, speaking with coordinators, Title IX coordinators at institutions, about um, you know what what are their thoughts about the law and the limits um, of this law on their college campus to achieve some of the social change that they're looking for. Um, no resources is a big one. And um, this person says, my biggest challenge is I have so much responsibility and zero resources. Um, other coordinators that we've spoken to so far have talked a little bit about, um, you know, why, why are we all focusing on college campuses? Why not look at pre-college? Um, nobody asked the question, this person says, why are we sending rapists to college? Um, so some, some sneak peek at some of our interview data there, um, getting a sense of what coordinators are, are thinking. So our final group that we really care about in terms of who's making meaning of Title IX is activists. Um, so um, a, a, a big part of um, what we're looking at uh, in terms of um, activists is actually um, you know, different, different types of activist groups. Um, and so trying to kind of map well, who are all the different people that are making meaning of this? Um, so for instance, we've sort of drawn up what we call this activist ecosystem, and there's kind of a couple of different axes here, so bear with me, I know it's sort of small. Um, on one axis, there's sort of some groups that are really nationally focused, that are, but that are very interested in very campus-specific um, uh, sexual violence, and there are others that are nationally focused that are interested in um, sexual violence more generally. Then you have much more campus focused um, groups that are more loosely organized. Um, everything from campus student organizations to even vigilantes. Um, I don't know if any of you've heard of like Mattress Girl, who literally walked around and, and kind of did the symbolic protest with her mattress. Um, so, very different kinds of activism. So, we're speaking with activists, and again, to give you a little bit of a, a sneak peek at some of the things that um, we're hearing from them thus far. Um, some are saying that things like mandated faculty reporting is problematic on campuses, that it can undermine um, some of the, uh, the trust that students place um, when they're reporting. Um, other uh, activists are saying that um, that policies that don't encourage reporting are problematic. So for example, um, one activist pointed out um, that dry campuses um, tend to be campuses like HBCUs, for example, um, with more underrepresented uh, students, and that can actually cause um, marginalized populations to even further, already underreport, to even uh, be further underreporting. Um, just kind of a peek at some of the results. So what are some of the future plans for the project? Um, we are continuing with data collection. We only have about 24 interviews thus far. We want to probably double that. Um, and we're seeking external funding. Um, so uh, again, grateful for the RF support because I think it's going to be able to help us seek that um, external funding. And again, um, thanks to the Office of Research for um, helping support me in, in seeking those, um, those external funds um, to continue this research. Um, we're also involving students both on this campus and at my colleagues' campus, um, both in the data collection um, and data analysis process. And um, our end goal is a book project um, with that legal mobilization framework. So that's where we're at now. Thank you.